Hi. Thanks for being here, and uh, yeah, thanks for having the invitation to be here on the Eclipse Camp this year. So I'm going to talk a little bit about one of our last projects in the uh, IoT area. It's a, a real customers project, and uh, we are trying out our first steps in the IoT domain there. Um, we chose the title Using Sensors to Reduce Wasted Support Time, and uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later on, because that's one of the main problems our customer had and wanted to have a solution for that. So uh, a little word about me. So who am I? I'm an IoT solution architect. Basically, that means I'm just taking some sensors and throwing that in a machine and then uh, connect, connecting that to the internet somehow, building a fancy cloud dashboard, whatever you think of an IoT solution stack. Um, but it's a little bit more like that. Uh, so I'm a developer from my heart. Uh, I love coding. I love clean code. And I hate messy code that breaks my heart. Uh, moreover, I'm a trainer for Java seminars, uh, for Java courses, so uh, I like to tell people about my knowledge and to simplify things so they can understand them and follow what I say. Uh, more than that, I'm a tester. I'm an ASQF certified professional for IoT, one of the first ones in Germany with Alex. Uh, we got that certification so that we can take a quality view onto projects. Uh, yeah, and more of that, I am a smart home addicted. Like, I love smart home. I have a, that's not my home cinema. Like, mine would leak. I choose another one because it looked a be little better. OK, but uh, enough words about me. Let's come to my uh, yeah, agenda. We're going to talk about the customer we met. <coughs> We're going to talk about the goals that our customer had, or the specific, from his view, more problems. We're going to talk about the solution that we chose, and we're going to talk about architectures, the quality of insurance we did in that, and then came to a point where we talk about challenges that we still have to uh, yeah, figure out how to solve them. And uh, in the last step, we're going to talk about some lessons learned. What can we say till here? What have we learned? OK, so uh, the first thing, uh, thing is rather general. It's, it is a real customer. So uh, too often when I uh, visit uh, IoT-like talks, it's like it's a hell of technology that picture to the right side, like a stack you can choose of different things. And too often is it's the MQTT edge fork digital twin buzzword bingo. So uh, that's rather far apart from the real thing. Like the customer won't pay me for that specific thing. He would pay me for the value that we generate with all of these things underneath. But IoT isn't all of these technology things. It's the value of the customer. Um, so we're trying to, to reach our project like it's targeted for a specific problem and that we want to solve that one, that we want to help that, because in the end, it's money that our customer has to pay. Um, <coughs> Yeah, our specific customer uh, is a one. Uh, he is a classical machine builder uh, or mechanical mechanical engineering. It's from the canning industry, uh, so he basically produces machines that can do things on the right side. I'm gonna clarify that soon. He has more than 25 years of experience in his domain, so he's really really experienced. He's a good uh, machine builder, and uh, yeah, he has 20 employees, and these are human beings. This will be important for later steps. Um, so he's an expert in the uh, deep drawing domain. Who knows what deep drawing is or tief seen in Germany? Okay, some that's good. I don't really, but I'm, I'll explain soon. But the important thing is our customer has no affinity to IT. That's totally not his business. He's good with deep drawing and he trusts us in being good with the IT solution. So he depends on us delivering a good project. Um, yeah, okay, some words to deep drawing. Uh, I'll put it as easy as I can. So uh, basically, you have some, some kind of metal plate, and you punch something else through that metal plate. That's a rather simple description. And then the metal plate or the blanket deforms to something else, for example, a can or something. Uh, so on the right side, uh, you can see a rather manual machine that does exactly that process. So if you turn that kind of Tire thing here uh, in the uh, on the top level, then uh, the uh, punch gets thrown through that blanket and it deforms the metal. We don't need to need to know more about deep drawing and what that machine builder does here. Okay, so that's the case. Think of that a little bit more out in an automated way. It's not really the machine to the right side. Uh, there is not someone sitting and actually <laughs> doing something. It's automated. But it was a good example, and we actually. Uh, we actually worked on that machine and tried our first experiments with sensors and things like that. OK, so uh, what are the goals of our customer? So uh, he's a really good customer because 
as he reached up to us, he already had a, a specific problem and a general strategy he want to face in the next years. So his specific problem is the title of this talk. He want to reduce support times because uh, the, it's the case that someone buys his machine, deploys it somewhere in the world, so his clients are using that machine. In some point, like two years later, they're changing a detail or whatever and call him and say, okay, your machine's not working anymore. So he's going to send someone over, he's paying for all of that, and the one just discovers that someone has changed the thickness of the metal from like a very, very small thing to just a, a bit of paper <laughs> or it, like, like something totally else or put it a laptop in that machine. Like it really misuse <laughs> of that machine. Um, so that could have been solved a little bit easier and that it's a, a relevant cost factor to him what he want to reduce. Um, the problem is he could then say, okay, you have to pay me that because that was obviously your fault, but if he does this, then probably that customer won't buy the next machine at him. So till here he takes over these costs and that's something that he don't like. Um, furthermore, he thinks, how can I be competitive in the future? He sees other companies, he's a small company, 20 employees. Uh, he sees other companies like, for example, Bosch telling great stories about, okay, and we ship sensors in our, uh, in our delivery trucks, and when they reach us, then we can decide whether that's a good truck or a bad truck by the sensors we put it in that. And we may even reject the deliverment and all the pieces inside and say, okay, we have to further check these before we accept them. He sees all kind of stuff going on in digital transformation and asks himself, okay, when I want to be on the field in five years, and I want to be still there with my 20 employees, what do I have to do to hold up on them a little? And that's why he came to us and asked, okay, how can we make a little bit IoT solution and how can we file a pilot project to see how things are working out? Okay, so uh, we did a, uh, did we did a, uh, Ah, yeah, three different, okay. Yeah, we did a cooperation from different IT companies, uh, three, uh, three at account, uh, which is because uh, yeah, we heard of things like software developers going to develop like, like software developers like I am from a stack like we have a front end, we have a back end, we have a database, things like that, really e rather easy. Two, okay, we have to mess up with sensors, we have to mess up with, with, with things like embedded devices, programming, totally different stuff than we made it before. So we uh, collected three IT companies. One is responsible for the sensors, for the gateway and getting the data to a cloud service. The next one builds up the cloud service and all the magic that happens there. We don't gonna look so close on clouds today. Uh, and the third company that's us uh, doing a little bit of quality insurance in that project and reviewing how everything works. Okay, so uh, well, that was a quick step. Um, we have chosen an architecture and I'm just gonna present that now. We're not gonna discuss why it's there, but that's the current uh, architecture we've chosen. So we have a kind of sensors. It's a temperature sensor somewhere. We have motion sensors. We have uh, a Google scope and accelerometer. And they are attached to our field boost coupler. Um, that is attached by a current loop, uh, and I don't know whether current loop is the exact same word as Stromschnittstelle in Germany. I think current loop is the right translation. So uh, that measures a, a voltage from 4 to 20 milliampere, and you can then do things with that. Let's take it as simple as that. After that, an industrial PC or gateway thing comes into the place, and these both talk uh, via the Modbus TCP protocol. Who's familiar with that? has at least heard of that, has used that, okay, oh, good. Um, and in the end, it's just sending out MQTT messages to a cloud-based service and then some fancy visualization dashboard thing, whatever. Um, so when we are that far, we first uh, take, like we ask, we started to ask questions. Okay, we know some interfaces between these devices now. We can talk about what's happening here, how is that connected, how is that put it up together, what's Modbus TCP, how are they connecting each other, how are they finding them in the field when they are deployed at the client side, how are we gonna send MQTT messages to the cloud. So the first questions uh, we've learned to ask now from various talks or projects is, uh, yeah, what are you doing with error handling? A rather simple question. Um, no developer that I know, and I'm a developer, so I'm allowed to say that I hate error handling. <laughs> That's not something I like about to do, but it's very necessary. And uh, if we think of that fancy method, 
Does anyone in that room has ever seen something like that in production code? For sure. That is, I'm not an, that's a pain in the ass. How many times, <laughs> how many times did a simple problem, a customer's problem that could have been solved easily came down to such a thing? Someone deciding, act, in this case, at least he commented that we don't need error handling here. I'd say you need that. At least a little bit of logging would have been nice. Raising exceptions would be another thing, but at least lock something when you totally agree that you don't need error handling here. Um, that's rather easy to find when you have the technology stack we've used to have, like we have a front end, we have a back end, we have a database. So either the problem lays in the back end, I'm just gonna review the log files and find the error. Or, that's a little harder case, I'm gonna call the one who said, okay, it's happening here, I'll get the log file, I'll take a look, I find the error. So why am I telling you this? Because this is not in any case IoT related. The problem is when we look now to something like our field bus coupler, all of the things that I've said, or the gateway, all of the things I've said now are useless. It doesn't help you to lock something somewhere in the field deployed in some company somewhere totally else you can't ever reach. You can call them, but that will be a very, very difficult task to get some log files from someone. So that can't be the solution in an, uh, in an IoT project. It's rather about a kind of notification things. Things like that are totally, totally uncool. You have to propagate error messages. You have to send them as far as you can. If you have no connection, you have a problem, okay. But if you at least have a connection, then propagate every error you have to not have to spend hours on finding them into the field. The second question we ask is uh, about connection here. Does it reconnect? So uh, my advice is to unplug and restart everything in the worst combinations you could think of. Unplug the sensors while they are running. Unplug the whole field bus coupler. Take away the voltage of the gateway. Hit the Modbus TCP server. I don't know. Kill the MQTT broker. Try to destroy things and get them back up running and see whether everyone in that whole row of IoT solution is able to handle that that may be so simple that you say that can't be that difficult, but it is. <laughs> um, so things like do we even reconnect or things like how many retries do we make? So a basic problem we actually have faced was uh, someone, some of the developers take an account that maybe a disconnect will happen at some point and implemented reconnect logic. But they actually never tested that because the MQTT broker, the cloud-based MQTT broker, had not a single second of off time rather while they were developing that solution. So yes, they have implemented something, but it was total crappy because all it did was a loop. He thought about, okay, I should reconnect. That's a good thing. I'm gonna try that for like half an hour. I'm not gonna do that every second. I'm gonna wait for a little bit of time. And what's after half an hour? the device is dead. It's unreachable for us forever, till you can go there and unplug it manually and reboot it. That could be really painful if you think of a Raspberry Pi thrown at a tree in some country you don't even live in. So that's something you don't wanna mess around with. Systems should be uh, yeah, as failure safe as they can and should live as long as they can. Okay. So these are the basic two questions we start when we uh, take into account quality insurance in an IoT project. But furthermore, we can look at some quality attributes. So there are different norms and standards that specify a lot of quality attributes. That's not even half of them. Uh, there are furthermore, and uh, even one of them, like ethics, you don't met ethics as a quality attribute in the most standards I know. So, but even ethics are a point, here was a good tutorial uh, that, ah, you're here, right? Your tutorial, ah, there you are, Tobias. Okay, yeah, a good tutorial about uh, ethics and how we deal, how we should deal with that in software development. Um, we're gonna look specifically now on uh, the, the highlighted ones. We're gonna see a, a little bit, gonna talk a little bit about compliance, about data privacy, about maintainability, about resilience, and in the end, about the performance. Okay, I have to check up the time, okay. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, the compliance and we're going to just look at compliance in terms of what we do with MQTT. Who's familiar with MQTT here? Okay, that's good. So we're going to just hit that a little. So MQTT is a published subscribe thing. You can 
publish messages or contents payloads to a specific topic. And a topic could look like something like that. So in our smart home solution, we have a kitchen and we're gonna provide the temperature. The payload may then be 21.7 degree, I don't know. So how are we gonna, you have to subscribe to those things on the other side. So we have a sensor, the sensor is sending that to somewhere and the one on the other hand should have registered himself on the MQTT broker saying, I wanna listen on that. So how are you gonna handle this little problem? So we have a typo there. So our sensor is publishing things to a topic that no one listens to. What's happening? If we, huh? Exactly, no data, not even an error message. The MQTT broker receives that, asks himself whether there's uh, one who's subscribed, says no, drops that message. <coughs> that could be uh, a little bit painful. We see that in the payload, like uh, from time to time, you have different formats of payload that you can send. Think of a JSON structure, like, okay, we're providing the temperature, this is a bit duplicated, but okay. And uh, we have the same typo in the payload. What happens now? The MQTT broker receives a message, the MQTT broker forwards that on the right topic, it goes to our backend, our backend is gonna pass the JSON string, gonna say, okay, we don't have a temp, I can't even read that out. We don't have a temperature in there, so, okay, failed, and dropped that message. That's, an that's a reasonable, uh, that's a, an easier problem. You're gonna figure that out soonish, right? Okay, if you have a sensor and that's publishing data to a wrong topic and doesn't match up, okay, that's, that's easy. If you have thousands of sensors sending data to the cloud and you have whysoever flashed something bad on one of them, you may start wondering why that one's never sending something. So you should consider of, at least for your test environment, taking in account that there are incoming things that just don't match up. We have spent a few hours on wasted time by figuring out that someone wasn't actually posting to the right topic and it could be as easy as he's missing the first slash or whatsoever. If you would be a little bit more verbose in the backend and try to log as much information as you can, that would have helped. So, uh, that may not be something for a production environment when you have to think about performance and uh, that you really get hit by a lot of data. Then taking an account, like then you have to decide whether, okay, do I wanna be verbose to have error handling as much as I can? Or do we now focus on performance and have to get messages through so we can't even handle every error? But that's a decision you should actively make and not just assume that someone does and some of the developers of think of that problem even being there. Okay, we come to the next one, maintainability. So a little bit of housekeeping in our field bus coupler. So you, you saw that it's connected some sensors, three of them in our case, and they are attached via that current loop interface. So when we talk of these sensors, we have to think of, okay, how did they even, what, what's that for a system? It, it's a lot of black boxes for us to quality ensure. So how is calibration made? There's a sensor, like let's take the temperature sensor, and the temperature sensor somehow says something between four and 20 milliampere to the, Modbus TC, uh, to the, to the field boost coupler. The field boost coupler then takes that amount of voltage and says, okay, that maps to a temperature. You have to specify that in that device. You can do that via some fancy application or something and flashing that onto the device, but you have taken an assumption here that that's the right thing. So maybe 13 milliampere matching 21.7 degree. So how was that assumption taken? As easy as the developer having the device on his desk, developing the solution, and thinking, okay, we have 13 milliampere, and in my room it's 21.7 degrees, and the rest is just a bit of, ah, if it's four milliampere, it will be less, <laughs> and something like that. The worst thing is not that how we made that calibration. The worst thing is that when we think of that, after we have configured that device, and after we have deployed that device to some manufacturer in the field, uh, to, to someone in the field, then we should think of how we change that. Since this calibration that may be done here isn't that good, you wanna be able to change that later on. The whole field bus coupler isn't designed for an IoT project. There is nothing of, there is no, no easy ability or interface built up from the uh, manufacturer 
to redeploy that. That was never the case when he manufactured this device. He thought of you flashing something, putting that down into your production site, using it and not changing it again. And if you change it, then please connect a cable and flash another version of software on that. So this device was rather, from a maintainability view, a bad decision to take in. And we're gonna come back, we're gonna even come back to that device because it really hurt it is in, on various levels in that project. Um, so the first thing they had was a kind of uh, self-made solution before they, uh, they take into account that buying something that actually is designed to do that from someone who knows what he's doing then uh, wins this, we do it ourselves or we, can, we buy something. Uh, but taking into account that you have different aspects in an IoT project was never the case. Like no one thought about, no one actually thought about a remote deployment of that thing. How can that be? That shouldn't be the case. Okay, we talked about that already when I asked the first question. So it's about resilience, how strong is your system? Can it survive different error states? We talked about that, like shutting down everything, booting it up in a different order, detaching something, looking whether it still is able to, to connect. Do we resend data? A decision you have to take when you do an IoT project. So the MQTT broker in the cloud is offline. The gateway somehow, well, the gateway can decide, let's design it like that. The gateway is getting the data from, let's take temperature data, and the MQTT broker is offline for half an hour. What are we doing? Are we buffering that data? Are we sending it later on? Or do we take an active decision and decide, okay, since it's just temperature data, it would, I don't need that, I may need that for historical reasons, but uh, the, we, we need that now for, okay, the system is back up, we're gonna transfer the new temperature data and everything is fine. That can be a decision you do. But you should think of if you've built an IoT solution that's an intruder detection to my house, I would rather like to know whether in the three seconds the MQTT broker was offline, someone entered my house. So that would be something that rather should be buffered and then sent later on. But you have to actively think of that and not just give a developer an assumption of, okay, I've coded something and it looks, it looks uh, trustworthy. You should think about all of these things. Okay, um, from resilience and intruding my house, we come to security and here we are back uh, to, uh, to our field this couple. Okay, in an IoT domain, almost everyone knows that security is a, at least a thing you should implement. So from username, password combinations to client certificates or pre-built tokens that are into that device, everything is fine and everyone, at least every project I know now thinks about these steps before going into the field. But uh, one of the main problems is your system being compromised. So what is your solution for a stolen token? Like, if you have, let's think of the, the device you're selling has a pre-configured uh, token and that one got stolen somehow. Someone is a nasty hacker <laughs> and uh, gonna, gonna yeah, screw everything out and, and get information he shouldn't have. What are you doing now? Think of, you have deployed the same device with the same password in many other wild fields somewhere. If someone has stolen their password, you actually would, it's not like, like on a website where you can uh, click, okay, then I wanna have a new one, just send me an email and I, I can somehow set that up back again. That's not the case in an IoT project. That will not be. Even the client certificate, yeah? Okay, we've taken about, okay, username and password isn't as safe as a client certificate, so we did that. A stolen client certificate, okay, I can revoke that on the other hand, so the attacker is rather safe, yeah, but that client certificate may be deployed onto your devices. So at least you're, you're smallering the damage that the attacker could give, but nevertheless, you are killing your whole solution with that. So you need a way or a solution to get another authentication token back into the field in a somehow secure way. And it may be that you take, that you discuss that and then decide, okay, if we actually ever have that problem, we don't have a fancy IT solution. Maybe that, that could be the case. Maybe the, the solution of implementing a good solution on that is more expensive than just saying, okay, we have, like here, we have 
five customers, 10 customers, in that case, they would have to send back their hardware. We're going to refresh everything and send them out again. But that's a decision you should actively make and not <coughs> be hit by in the field when you get compromised. OK, so uh, I said that because of, uh, yeah, or, or in security, we're going to talk about the field boost couple. And uh, OK, thank you. Uh, we have the Modbus TCP protocol. And you know what's the funny thing about the Modbus TCP protocol? It's not designed for authentication. There is nothing like that in that protocol. It's really low level. That may be fine. That is fine when you have a production network, when you have all your machines into a separated segment of the network. But it may be worth telling our customer who, isn't, who doesn't have affinity to IT that he's soon is going to sell a solution to his clients who trust him because he is good in the things he does, and he's selling them something that they're going to put into the network that's totally accessible then from inside of the network. Everyone that can reach that device has full access. That means not only reading the temperature senders, but manipulating them. It could be an interesting thing, and you, can, you could say it's not exposed to the internet, so it's rather secure. But think of an... I don't know, an old computer somewhere in that client's network who may not even be any affinity, uh, don't have any affinity to IT either. And there's an old machine which is totally good hackable from the outside. And if that's the case, it, and it's on the same network as our chosen uh, field bus coupler, then this whole solution is easily compromised. And we have a manipulation of data, and the first thing could be a good thing. Like someone monitoring how the devices in his, uh, in, his, uh, in his production site are running, and you are changing values, giving him the feeling of everything's fine, but it isn't. Things that shouldn't actually happen. So you have to at least think of that or build a solution. Like, OK, we're going to have to hide that device behind another device. We have to set up a different network segment for that. Solutions that are workable, but you have to discuss them with people in our case that, are, that have no affinity to IT, that aren't aware of that problem. That's one of the main things we had to do to, to uh, yeah, aufklären, to, to explain things to them that are just not their domain. Yeah. Okay. Um, so from security, we're going to come to data privacy and uh, collecting things on a machine as a nice thing in an IoT project. So think of our IoT project being able to tell you the following. The machine fails on every second Tuesday around 6 a.m. Do you see any problem here? Someone? Yeah? What? And, Update from, yeah, OK, interesting fact. Exactly, yeah, could be. <laughs> like, OK, it's every time the same time. Yeah, we, we're going to see that from a data privacy view. So uh, are we even, we have to question that. Are we allowed to take, the, to give out this sentence in times of GDPR and DSGVO things? Is that a cool thing? We heard of another project who had exactly faced the same projects and then, then contact a government agency and asked, OK, we're going we're gonna to do the following. Is that cool or is that uncool? And it's totally uncool when you are able to put over the shift schedule and somehow discover whatsoever is happening on Tuesday mornings around 6 AM. But if there is someone working on that machine, and it's every time he's working every second Tuesday, and he's starting his shift at 6 a.m., then you have personal data. And you have at least a problem when you don't inform the one and have his agreement on you collecting data while he's messing up and destroying your machines. And that's an actual problem. So at least we should, our not IT affine uh, customer should be informed that he's going to sell a product that, if the data is wrongly used, is easily to hit a law and have a problem with that. So we have to explain everything of these details to him before we ship out this solution. And he has then, like, it's, it, is, it may be as easy for him as saying, OK, client, you've bought my machine. We're doing the following. And I would advise to you that you don't put the shift table over that, because that's 
in general bad idea. But it would be a nice saying for people who have an any affinity in IT and believe in us. Okay, so the last uh, quality attribute we're going to discuss is performance. Uh, we're going to be a little bit faster on that because I'm running out of time. <laughs> Um, so uh, think of performance in the gateway, the sampling rate. We, take, uh, we took in an assumption while well, we calibrated that device be, uh, in cases of the sensors, like a temperature sensor. It may not be as necessary as asking the temperature sensor very, very highly what the temperature is, because the changes may be rather small. But the sampling rate for a motion sensor could be really, really interesting, because if you ask the system that's punching metal all the time, like, now, and now, that would have been a really bad decision because you have lost one of that hits to the metal and would have built it up wrong data. So you should think about how you calibrate these devices right. Scalability. So we have a field bus coupler here and we should think of how many field, like we may have a client that has many machines that needs more than one of these field bus couplers that needs do we may even need another gateway on his side because of the data, the, the size of the data? Like, do we need aggregation on his side? All of these things have to be thought through before we ship our product, very much more than in a normal software project. Okay, so challenges we have to do, do on uh, is communication is even more important. That was a big thing for us. Even, not, not even the IT guy and the customer, but the different IT guys meeting each other, like the embedded developer and the high-level developer who talk two different languages when they, they speak to each other. When it comes down to current loop and what was TCP and on the other hand fancy cloud MQTT things, then these two have to understand each other and have to really, really get a view for the other one. Okay, so the good thing is uh, we are finding out whether the value of our solution is even, it's, it is a pilot project. We don't know how valuable that is for the customer. So uh, we have to see, like, it's, I'm not going to talk in detail about costs, but uh, that's not a full cell product, it's more a pilot project where we are transparently work together with each other and want to learn from each other. Um, so. You have to take into account, it may be cheaper for him, in his case, to send his support specialist out than that he can soonish send an even expensive IoT specialist to the field who then does a redeployment because the solution is crap. Yeah, I'm going to just skip over these because my time is ticking. Um, we have some lessons learned that we have brought with. Uh, IoT isn't just a few sensors. It's not me throwing some sensors at some machines, connecting them with the cloud, and then being almost done. IoT is much more. IoT isn't just software. IoT is so much hardware. And when I've learned something from the talks I've been to this week and also the last year and other conferences, then me, myself, as a software developer, a high-level software developer, I don't want to mess around with hardware stuff. That's not my business. That's my, I, I can't do that. And I should, be, I should agree on that. There are specialists outside. But I shouldn't think as a software company, we can do all that by ourselves. I heard too many cases where that failed. The field is, now I have to try to find what the field is mean. There's, the field is assy. The field will do things to you you don't even have thought of. IoT project that actually deploy Raspberry Pis to some trees and collect data, just to a year later notice that these Raspberry Pis are a little bit rusty and won't work anymore. All of these projects happened already. Another big thing we haven't talked about today is big data doesn't mean smart data. Just because we're collecting a lot of things and pushing them onto our cloud service doesn't mean that we actually have a smart predictive maintenance solution. We are not that far, it's not that easy. And in the end, we always have to think about the created added value that our IoT solution generates. It's not the buzzword bingo we like to play. It's not the technology my heart beats for. It is whether our customer gains something out of that and can use that for his business. Last slide. 
quality is value to some person, said Gerald Weinberg, and it's not always about quality insurance like we are used to. It may even be things like, for you, for your specific use case, an IoT solution is too expensive and you can just stick to the old one. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, yeah, a short question. I haven't finally understood. Can you can you repeat that once? A little? I haven't I haven't understood that. <laughs> 